invite you to stand up, welcome online, and in the building with us. We're here to worship the Lord, amen? Who's here to worship the Lord? Let's see.
at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. So, chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lord, we live in it, we claim it today, and we sing. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of Lord, we thank you for all of your spirit that you have poured out on sons and daughters, Lord, that you poured out on us, Lord, that you filled us with. We thank you that it teaches, it guides us, Lord, also that, that you can heal. Lord, and in your presence, there's mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, healing, Lord. We know a lot of people in our body, in our church, need physical healing today. Think of Scott Rainish. Think of our brother Chris. Lord, and even when things look impossible, you yourself said, with God, all things are possible. So Lord, we believe that, we receive that, we rest in that, we take confidence in that, Lord. I just wanna pray over everyone who needs healing right now in whatever form, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would heal them. Lord, we pray that it would be for your glory. We come to you because we, we know that you're able. Lord, and sometimes you have to bring us low so that we can look up. We're looking up, Lord. We want to give it to you, Lord. Right now, Lord, we just want to rest with you. So Lord, as we sing this song, may we be reminded of you and that you are with us in every situation. Will you just sing that over yourself? There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thinking compare. You're our living Please. 
for your presence here this morning. I'm grateful, Lord, that no matter what we feel, you're here. Sometimes, Lord, we just, um, we really long for those times where it just feels like you're here. And there's other times, Lord, when you may be tired or weary or we may be going through stuff where we don't feel it, but you're just as real just as present. God, I pray for your presence to just inhabit every person and encourage and strengthen and heal as Pastor Cedric already prayed, Father. We continue to pray for healing in the lives of those who need physical touch. We prayed for Scott. I want to pray for his wife and children today and their extended family that are gathered there around the hospital bed fearful and worried, concerned and Lord we just pray that you would continue to sustain them sustain them in their in their um, their grief 
their hurt, bring comfort, bring hope. We pray also, Lord, that you'll continue to just be with, as Cedric said, for our brother Chris. Good to see him today in church, Lord. What a, what a victory. Praise your name for that. We love him and continue to ask that you would just continue to give him strength in his body as he recovers and gets stronger and stronger, Lord. Thanks for a great week of children's camp. Thank you for the work you did in the lives of our, of our little boys and girls, Lord. We just thank you for that. We love you today. We pray for Pastor Kaylee and, and Josh. They're going to be leaving tomorrow and next Saturday they're going to say I do to each other. Would you bless them? Give them a wonderful week as they prepare for their wedding day. And then would you give them a great week on their honeymoon? And um, may it be glorious. Bless their families, I pray. Can you just maybe just take a moment of silence and just sit in his presence? be good for us just to go back and sing that chorus one more time. Holy Spirit, we need you. Let's sing together. Because mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory God's people said, amen. Take a moment to greet one another, would you? Turn around, shake some hands, fist bumps, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Welcome each other to church today. Pastor Kyle's going to come. All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Ooh, we got to try that again. I feel like every time I come up, we got to try it again. Good morning, everybody. There we go. That's what I like to hear. Well, welcome all of you guys um, who are here with us um, in-house. We are so thankful that you guys are here this morning. We also want to welcome those of you who are online. Um, welcome as well. We are so glad that you guys are here. Um, our first announcement is just to um, fill out our response card, uh, whether you are online or whether you are here in-house. Um, we would love for you guys just to be feeling that out so we can just know what's going on in your life so we can be praying for you as a staff. Um, if you guys want to volunteer or whatever it may be, get involved. That is the, the, one of the best ways that you guys can um, be a part of that and how we can get connected, all that good stuff. Uh, next announcement is giving. There are many ways to give here at All of Knowles. You can text. You can um, go online. You can give in the offering box there in the back, or you can mail it in, mail a check-in, whatever it may be. Um, we are so thankful for all your guys' givings. Um, the next announcement is, if I can read, the Global Leadership Summit. How many of you guys are going to that? All righty. I love it. It's going to be awesome. It'll be here um, this Thursday and Friday, I believe. Um, we still, you still have the opportunity, if you have not signed up, to sign up 
for Global Leadership Summit, and I believe the cost is, Kevin, what is it? 120, just kidding, it's 139. Um, it is 139, so I very much encourage you, all of our leaders and who have been here or been to a Global Leadership Summit before, encourage you guys to sign up for that because it's going to be awesome, and we get to do it here together in-house. So um, sign up for that if you haven't already. Um, the next announcement is our Back to School Blessing. Uh, which is going to be happening um, August 11th and 10th, I believe. We'll be going to um, a few places that our church is involved with, handing out backpacks and school supplies to um, people who need it. And so it's a great opportunity if you'd love to help out with um, setup for that as well, um, putting backpacks together, pa talk to Pastor Debbie. You can also give in the back whatever um, is needed. There's a table back there for all that good stuff. So um, the next announcement is there's no slide for it, but how many of you guys in here like to deep sea fish? All right, okay, a couple. Wow, no wonder I don't have any signups. All right, so um, I was told by students, by many students, yeah, I want to go, and then a lot of them are busy. So we are having a trip this week for youth, um, which is happening Tuesday through Wednesday, but there's an opportunity for parents, families, anybody in the church who wants to go. We are chartering a boat on Wednesday from 7 to 1 in Pismo to go deep sea fishing. Um, the cost is 140 and that gets you everything that you need, um, tackle, the bait, license, all that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in that and would like to go, basically you'd be meeting us there, um, coming, getting there and leaving on your own, all that good stuff. Um, come talk to me in the back. So we have a lot of spots to fill and I'm stressing out a little bit. So that is um, our announcements for today, so let's um, just continue with our service with this little video. Thank you, guys. I want you to imagine this morning that you, um, you're, you work at an office park or someplace where there is a, um, a trail that you could go for a walk on during your lunch break. It's a nice trail. It's a place where you can stretch your legs, get a little exercise, get a little fresh air. And this trail that you're, um, that you're about to embark on has several different... Um, different options that you can choose to go on. You could, you could take the trail that will take you all the way around this wonderful lake. You could see the ducks and kind of feed the ducks, kind of enjoy that experience. There's another trail that will take you to another spot where there's probably some, some rabbits and squirrels and other small wild animals that are just there in the fields and you could enjoy that and you do this on a daily basis every day you go and you enjoy a nice little walk you don't have a lot of time so you 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 usually take the path that is that that you kind of know it's kind of a path that's well worn other people have done it but uh, you notice on this um on this day that there is a there's another journey or another pathway that um that seems to be overgrown, that seems to be taking you to a place that since you only have a little bit of time for lunch, you, you don't really go on that path because you've never been on that path before. It's never, it's never been anything that you've, you've kind of um, um, discovered or whatever. But you notice as, as you're passing on, this, on your lunch break and you've decided to take the path that leads you to around the lake, that there is this, uh, it looks like there is a, there's a letter that is just down the path a little bit, and the letter is a V. You don't know what the V stands for. 
You don't know what it really means. It's kind of all overgrown, so you, you just kind of, it just kind of catches your eye, and you just kind of walk on, and, uh, and, and you kind of think, well, I wonder what that V stands for. And the next day you come back and somebody has, um, has kind of cleared that path away a little bit more. And you're kind of shocked because there's not only a V, but under the V there's an I. And under the I there's an E. And under the E there's a W. And it says view. And there is a view that you are that you uh, notice on this path. It's, a, it's, a, it's not well worn, but you see, you see the sign that says view on it. And it catches your eye, and on this day you decide, all right, I am going to take the path that has the sign that says view on it. You begin to walk down that road, and it is exactly what you thought it was going to be. It's kind of overgrown. It's not well worn. You, you can tell that other people haven't walked this path as much as you haven't. So you kind of you make your way down this path and there's thorns and there's, there's overbrush that's going on. There's trees that have kind of fallen on the path a little bit. But you keep making your way and soon the path begins to take you up, 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 and, and you, you actually are kind of shocked because you're not really prepared with the right shoes on. It's a little bit slippery that day, and, and you keep going. You even have to stop and catch your breath a little bit. But you then get your breath, and you continue up this path, and soon there is a clearing that comes up, and all of a sudden there is like, wow! You see across the valley... You see a town that's just down the road, and you can see above the town, you can see the, the hills, the streams, and you see the beauty of God's creation, and all of a sudden, it's like, why didn't I take this path before? This is a picture of the scripture that we're going to read this morning. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse number 18. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of those welcome additions here in the journey that we are going through in the book of Romans that, that is surprising. And for many people, they kind of even jump over this section of Scripture a little bit. Paul has been, has been talking about, you know, the, the wrath of God and the justification that comes through Jesus Christ. And talked to Liz, in the beginning part of chapter 8, he talked about this, the Holy Spirit and the freedom that he gives to you and the sanctifying power of the Spirit that, that he does in our lives. And it's a wonderful thing but here in verse number 18 it's like Pat, Paul takes a little bit of a journey and he wants to give us a view he wants us to open our eyes to see that salvation is not just something that's personal it's not just something for you on your personal individual journey that God is also interested in redeeming his creation the beauty of of all that God has created. And it's like Paul here in this portion of Scripture is giving us a view. He's giving us a look into the future. Helping you to see where you are and looking out into the future of where God is going to recreate Bring a new heaven and a new earth. Bring a new spirit, a new power. He is going to bring all things new. And he's going to allow you to just get a window into what he is doing both now and into the days, weeks, months, years to come. And he's at work. So let's read together Romans chapter 8 together. Take your Bibles and let's look at the view that Paul wants to give to us today. Would you stand with me? Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin at verse number 18. We're going to go back to 17 in a moment, but we're going to read from verse number 18 where we left off last week. I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Verse number 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, 
but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we, are, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what you already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Thank you, Lord, for this glimpse, this view, this, this picture, Lord, of being able to see something that we don't normally see or even think about. I pray that you would help each of us to have eyes to see, faith to believe, and patience to wait, eagerly expecting, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Paul is moving from talking about that, that present ministry in, 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 in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, where last week we talked about the freedoms that we have. And I'll just remind you of where he was. He was talking about this freedom that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life pleasing to God in this life. That we can, that we, God not only did something for us, he wants to do something in us. And the work that he does in us is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that transforms, that sanctifies, that cleanses, that renews, that transforms us from the inside out. And we even learned last week that we no longer have an obligation to the, to the old sinful nature. We no longer obligated to actually live the old way. But we are actually, because of the Spirit of God, we have an obligation to, to live a life and to please God by fulfilling the law of God that he provided all the way back at the time of Moses. That that law that brought death was now being, being, being used in a powerful way through the Spirit to allow us to have life and life everlasting. That we could love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. That we have this new identity. And, and in, the, in the last few verses of last week's message, we talked about that we could actually praise God and we could sing out, Abba, Father, Abba, Daddy. And his spirit, the Holy Spirit, would witness with our spirit that we are his children, children of God. And he actually ends this whole section, he says, in verse number 17, he says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Could I just tell you that's huge? <laughs> this is huge. You are, not only, you are not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. You actually get to sit at the table of the King of Kings, of, of God the Father, with God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He considers you his children. We are the children of God. We have been adopted. We have been bought, gra grafted in. We have been, we've been, we've been treated as if we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And it says, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. It's this... It's this, we are living in what, what I call the in-between period of time. In between the, this time where we are experiencing God's presence and all of his fullness through the indwelling spirit of God that's within us. But we still live in a fallen world. We still live in a broken world. 
And so we have all of the blessings of God's spirit in us. We have the power of God in us. We have the, we have the assurance of God within us. We have freedom that we sang about the spirit this morning where we say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that freedom that he's talking about is that we're free to live the way we're supposed to live. We're free to live as holy people. He says, but in the middle of all that, we also experience suffering. We experience the heartache of a broken world. And I've seen that so clearly this week. Could I just tell you? Spend a week at children's camp. It will open your eyes. I got to spend a whole week with boys and girls. And it was a phenomenal time. I I really, really enjoyed getting to know the almost 30 kids that came from Olive Knoll's. We have some incredible, incredible children here at our church. And each of them are special and unique. But could I tell you, as I got to know, especially the six boys that were in my cabin, I discovered that they carry around some of the scars of this world already. They carry around some of the burdens and hurts. They carry around some of the struggles even in their almost innocence of seven, eight, nine, and ten years old, they are, they are some of our children, they have already experienced things that none of us would want them to experience. Some of them are born into situations that are difficult and heartache. And they, they are experiencing sufferings. But in the middle of all of that, I also discovered that God the Holy Spirit was present and he was moving in such a way that their lives were beginning to change. I saw them sing and praise God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I saw them raise their hands. I saw them respond to the call of God in their life. And I saw seven of our I don't know, 15 boys came, received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior this week. It's pretty cool. They enjoyed God's creation. They enjoyed, they enjoyed, you know, zip lines and they enjoyed canoeing and they enjoyed seeing a bald eagle, literally a bald eagle flying over the lake. And it was just like stunning. And you could see all of the kids going, wow. In the middle of all that, God was present. And you see the tension that happens as we live in this in-between period in time. We are living in a time where God has poured out his son, Jesus Christ. He has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us. We are living in the time between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Between between the, the glory of his presence, which he calls the first fruits of his spirit, and the anticipation of our final and complete salvation that's going to happen. And we live in, the, in that time in between those two. And the scripture says that we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. And there really is as human beings, at least as far as how we experience, you cannot experience glory without experiencing suffering. Here's what I've, one of the things I've learned over my years of life. God is closer in my sufferings than he is in my mountaintops. He's closer. He's more, he's more, he does his greatest work in our life of refining us, of making us, of transforming us, of 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 shaping our lives in such a way that we actually become more and more like Jesus Christ when we go through the fire of life, when we go through the trials and tribulations and sufferings. We draw closer to him and he draws closer to us when we walk in our sufferings. So we share in his sufferings that we may also share in his glory. But notice what Paul says here in verse number 18. As he takes us down this journey, this this pathway of helping us to see a view. He says, I consider... I can imagine Paul considering, remember, if you think back on Paul's life, prior to him writing this letter, 
He had been shipwrecked. He had been beaten. He had been left for dead. He had been tried. They tried to assassinate him. They tried to kill him. He had been to the place where he was hungry. He was lost. He was in jail. I mean, he went through all kinds of sufferings. You think you've suffered. You probably, most of us haven't even close to gotten through what Paul had to go through in his journeys. He says, I consider, or, or the, the King James Version says, I reckon, I reckon that, uh, that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In other words, they're not even, in, you shouldn't even compare them they're not even comparable. That the sufferings that we are experiencing on this planet in this time and period where, where sufferings and glory are kind of happening all together, where we're living in this in-between time, it says you really can't compare our present sufferings to our future glory. Our future glory. And one of the things I was thinking about this week as I was preparing for this message, and let me tell you something, it's kind of interesting that you try to prepare a sermon at children's camp. <laughs> First of all, you're on 24-7. There is no break. There literally is no break. You are dad all week long. They're with you. I had one little guy, everywhere I went, he was right there. Everywhere I went, it's like, oh, there you are again. Whoa, there you are again. There he is. I tried to get away, tried to have a moment in the bathroom. There he was, outside the bathroom. <laughs> he was my little buddy. By the way, I discovered he doesn't have a dad. He has no male companionship in his life. That's why men... We need you. The church needs you. The next generation needs you. They need you to step up. Not only for your kids, if you have kids, but other kids who don't have dads. Take them to a ball game. Spend time with them. Go fishing with them. Go to children's camp with them. Be their VBS director. Be their Sunday school or their children's ministry small group leader. It's huge. It makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. I thank God for my time at children's camp. But, I, but I, it's not even worth comparing, he says, the glory that will be revealed in us. The glory that will be revealed in us. Our trials and our tribulations. Glory, by the way, is an interesting word. When we think about the word glory. I was, I was looking at uh, one guy who said this about glory. He says, Paul uses the word glory. It's an abstract noun describing a quality possessed by a person or a thing that metaphorically shines has great weight on it. The verb form, which is to glorify or to give glory, involves recognizing or praising one who possesses glory. It is not to give something he or she does not already have, but only to acknowledge it. Sometimes around church here, people will say to me, hey boss, hey boss. And I want to say, I'm not the boss. But it's almost a way to to give respect. Your pastor, you're our pastor. You're the one who's in charge. And so it's a, it's a, it's a way of honor, you know. It's a, way to, it's a way to allow them to have honor in their lives. We sometimes use the word to, uh, to give honor. For example, we might refer to an unusually intelligent person as bright or brilliant. We might say a job well done is a shining performance. We may refer to celebrities as stars or bright lights or speak about an important student leader as the big man on campus or speak of use of the power of influence of throwing one's weight around. Well, God deserves glory. Why? Because he's glorious. He's glorious. 
He deserves all praise and honor and glory. And there are times when you look around his creation and you are blown away. You're like in awe of God. That's the glory. The glory of his majesty and his oneness. And the scripture tells us that the glory that will be revealed, and notice what it says, in us. In other words, you and I will actually participate in the glory of God someday. We will actually see his glory and we will actually, we will actually derive our glory from his glory. We don't have any glory in ourselves because we are created, but he is the creator who has made us. And when we are in right relationship, when it's all done and over and we are fully re redeemed by, the, by all that he does, the scripture says you will experience his glory. I was thinking, I wonder if there's anyone in heaven that would really want to come back to earth. I don't think so. I mean, can you imagine getting to all of the glory and wanting to come back here? Even though they miss you, they're waiting on the other side for you, amen? They're not coming back and they have no desire to come back because it is absolutely splendid. And God says it's not even comparable. So I just want you to just take a moment to just reflect on your present sufferings. And then instead of comparing it to your future glory, contrast it with your future glory. It is marvelous. Amen. That's why sometimes when I sit at the bedside of somebody who's very sick, you know what they say? I'm ready to go. I, I really have greater desire to go than to stay. Oh, there's some longing to stay, but going is far better, especially when you know the Lord and you know that this body is temporary. And so Paul goes on, to give us three groans. He talks about three different kinds of groans. He first of all says creation's groans and hopes. Notice what he says. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation itself. He's talking about the creation of God is actually eagerly expecting for the day when Jesus Christ comes back in all of his fullness. When those who have been redeemed by the by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's us as the humans who have been made his children, his sons and daughters of God, that we are actually have our full redemption of all that God promises us through his redemptive power, that our bodies are redeemed, that, the, that creation is eagerly expecting that day. It's longing for it. For creation, he says, was subjected to frustration. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. Catch this. Creation is frustrated. I think we're aware of that, aren't we? Got home Friday and I watched the NBC News Friday night. You know what three of the major stories on the NBC News were? Let me tell you what they were. Fires in the West, floods in the East, heat all over. You can't watch the news without the news reporting on creation. You can't watch the news without hearing about floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, 
storms, rain, whatever it might be. It's like all of God's creation is going, this is something wrong. There's something wrong. And those who do not have faith or understand that God is the creator of all, they want to scientifically figure it all out. And I'm not opposed to that, but they leave God out. Creation groans. It has been subjected to frustration by, not by its own choice, notice it. It's not like creation says, I don't, I, I, don't, I, want, I don't want everybody to have enough water and I don't want to have, I want all the storms to be easy. It's not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In other words, when human beings, which was God's ultimate creation, when he created you and I, he created us in his image, put us in a garden that was perfect, put us in a place where it all worked perfectly together. And man violates God's laws, falls, and as a result, the creation itself is subjected to the curse that man is also subjected to. It's like creation begins to cry out. You can see that by, I don't have a lot of time today, but before the fall of man in Genesis 1, you can see God says, I give you every seed bearing plant, uh, plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit will seed it. They will be yours for food. And he goes on to talk about how, how everything was so beautiful. If you read Genesis chapter 1, every day God creates something new, something new. And on the seventh day he rests. And after the sixth day before he rests, he actually says it was very good. In other words, all that he had created was good. And man was there in the garden. And it was a beautiful place. God creates Adam and Eve and places them there. They run around naked, without shame. They are connected to God. They're connected to their creation. They're connected to one another. It's beautiful and wonderful. And God says, there's only one law I give you. Don't touch the tree. And the serpent comes along and tempts. And we know the story. There's the fall of man. And after the fall of man, Scripture says, because you listened to your wife and ate the tree about which I commanded you, Adam, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce, notice what it says, thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat of the food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken from, for dust you are, and dust you will return. Death happens everywhere. It happens in the mountains. It happens in the valleys, it happens in the streams, it happens in vegetation, it happens in the animal kingdom, it happens in the, in the community of, of the oceans. I mean, I even wore my shark shirt for you today. Because you know what the fourth story in the NBC News was? It was about the sharks on the East Coast. And there were so many sharks that there were actually more shark bites that are happening more frequently than ever before in recorded history. Now that's only the recorded of counting shark bites, but it is what it is. But the world is frustrated. It's frustrated. But he says here, notice what he says. Because, wait a second, that's the wrong slide. That's the wrong slide. This is what it should be. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in chains of ch pains of childbirth right up to the present time. He compares the groaning of creation to a woman in labor. Ladies who have had babies, what's it like to be in labor? It's not fun, is it? Does anybody, by the way, keep a picture and a video of the labor experience to show to everybody? 
Here's what I looked like while I was in five minutes before I gave birth. Here's what my face was like. I can recall clearly when Jane was going to have Weston. Here's what she said to me as she's in labor. I don't want to do this. Take me home. I was like, honey, it's not going home. I don't want to do this. Take me home. Now, Jane is a very controlled person in public when she doesn't know anybody. She controls herself. But let me tell you, she had no control that day before Weston was born. It was Wah! Screaming, yelling. It was painful. It was difficult. And she said things she would never say. It's kind of what creation is doing. But when the baby is born, what happens to all that pain? When the child is laid on the chest of the mother, there is comfort, there is joy, there is peace. And all of a sudden, it's like, ah. Eager expectation. And when you get to that moment of glory, it's not even worth comparing to the journey of the pain. Why would anybody have a second child if it was? I love this phrase, liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. As you look on that view, you look in the view of the future. Here's the view. The view that God wants you to see. It's going to be over. All of the craziness of creation is going to come to an end. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God is at work in redeeming not only you, but California, Yosemite, the Sequoias, the floods of the Appalachians, the tornadoes of the plains, those who are living on fall, earthquake fault lines will be all healed, there will be a new heaven and a new earth and there will be liberation of all the vegetation, all the animals, all of the mountains and the valleys and the streams, all of the clouds and the weather. The weathermen will have no jobs anymore. It'll be beautiful. Well, he goes on to talk about human groans. And notice what he says. Not only so, not only so about creation, he says, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, what do we do? We groan inwardly as we what? As we await the adoption of as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I just got to tell you this. Every one of the boys and girls who are born into this world with birth defects, All the syndromes, all of the mental retardations, all of the, all of the physical defects, mental defects, emotional defects that they are just born into this world with are going to be redeemed, praise God. There will be a day when, when, when those who suffer with Lou Gehrig's disease or muscular dystrophy or who have, who've had a stroke like Scott Rennish and probably if he survives and we pray he does, he will have a long, long journey to recover to some measure of life, but he'll never be the same. He will live with a body that doesn't function right anymore. And those of you who are old... And there's just a couple of you here. There'll be a new body, a new soul. This 
is what Paul is saying to us. We groan inwardly as we what? What are we waiting for? The redemption of our bodies. We have saved. We've been redeemed. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We have all of God's presence in us. We have victory over sin, but we still live in a fallen, broken world. And sometimes we live in a fallen, broken body. And it needs to be transformed. And so we wait for that day that that will happen. We eagerly wait. Notice what he says here. He says, he says, notice he says, the fruit, first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait. That's the hope, the redemption of our bodies. I love what Paul goes on to say over in 2 Corinthians 5. Now we know that if the earthly tent, that's what he calls his body, we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, he says, we groan, we longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because we are clothed, we will not be found naked. In other words, we will go back to the original creation of God when we were in Adam and Eve and there was no death and there was no shame, there was no guilt and there was complete openness. God is going to do that. I love this image. We are waiting on our tiptoes, leaning forward. We are eagerly anticipating. We see the future. We can't quite touch it yet. We can't quite get there. We can see the view. But we're up on the railing and there's a large cliff and there's a valley over there. And we're looking at the view and we're going, wow, God, I can see the day. I can see the day when all things will be new. A few years ago, my father-in-law, who was a six-foot-five, strong man, pastor for most of his life, played basketball in college, could have played pro basketball, athletic, strong, a man in charge, got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. You know how hard it is for a man who can't control the drool? Can't control the Trevors? Walks in such a way that he almost falls every time he walks. Has to have somebody tie his shoes, button his shirts. Cannot control himself when he goes to the bathroom. I bet you Fred would tell you today, I'm eagerly expecting a new body. He's on his tiptoes. He's leaning forward to the day when he'll be set free from this. Just look at those kids. Such potential in a broken world. I had to throw this one up. These are my six boys. Of the six boys, five of them are from a single parent home. Some of these boys have experienced utter poverty. They don't even know if they're going to get a meal sometimes.
For in this hope we are saved, but the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what is already has? I love what he says here. But if we hope for what we do not have, yet we wait for it patiently. This is what the human race is doing. This is what we who are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ are doing. We are living in the in-between, anticipating and waiting eagerly for the hope of the renewal, of the change, of the newness of God in all things. This is what Paul's trying to get to us here. He could have skipped this view. He could have jumped all the way to Romans chapter 8, 28 and said, all things work together for good. But right here, he's taking us down a path that nobody wants to go. And we're seeing the groanings of the creation itself, the groanings of human beings, yet who have been saved, who have been redeemed, but who still experience what it means to be human in all of its fallenness. We wait. And we do it patiently. We pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray and we want his kingdom to break forth in our lives, in our world, in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our nations, and all around the world. We want to see all of the craziness go away. And we work towards that and we pray towards that. But ultimately, we know that God's going to break forth again. Because look what he says. The Holy Spirit groans. And I'll close with this. In the same way. Now, catch this. In what way? In the same way creation groans. In the same way the humans groan. In this in-between time. We have the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we do not know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And notice what the Spirit does. It it intercedes for us with what? Groans that words cannot express. How many of you have had situations where you go, I don't even know what to pray or how to pray? If you haven't experienced that, you haven't lived life long enough. had this one guy in my church when Weston was newly born. He would come up to me and he'd say, I'm praying for healing in Weston's life. I'm praying that the downs will just go away. And I looked at him, I was like, I want to smack you. I want to punch you right in the nose. Get away from me. Because that's not going to happen. So today, I eagerly anticipate and pray. At times, I do not even know how to pray, but I pray and the Spirit of God knows me. He knows my situation. He knows my troubles. He knows everything about it. And I trust the Lord, not only Jesus to intercede for me, but the Holy Spirit who works in me begins to pray on my behalf to God the Son, to God the Father. He groans. He groans. This is not just some heavenly language, but he actually takes the pain, the heartache, the the confusion, the, the lack of understanding of how do I live in this broken world with things I can't make sense of? How do I live in all of that? And God begins to take it and he understands because he knows all things and he sees the present, the the past, the present, and the future all together. The Spirit. When I don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. But he doesn't end there because here's how he ends. And he... The Holy Spirit. By the way, some versions translate this he as father. I disagree with that. I think he's talking about the spirit here. He. The Holy Spirit is not a force. It's a person. 
It's the third person of the Trinity. He who searches our hearts. What is the job of the Holy Spirit? To search you. Okay? He searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit. I love it when the Scripture says this, that the Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit gives us assurance that we have been redeemed, we have been saved, we have been sanctified. We are His children, and we know that we know that we know because our spirit connects with the Spirit of God, and the Spirit connects with each other, and there is, there is unity, there is connection. And so when the Spirit moves in your life and the Spirit begins to search you, all of a sudden the Spirit can sing for you. The Spirit can speak for you. The Spirit can comfort you. The Spirit can guide you. The Spirit can teach you. But the Spirit is what works in your life. It's the second person, the third person of the Trinity who makes Jesus known to us. And I love what he says, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. You know who's interceding for you? You're the saints. The Spirit is always at work on your behalf. Even when you don't ask, he's there. In accordance with what? God's will. Not working your will. It's working his will. Stand up, would you? Get on your tippy toes. If you can. Don't fall over if you can. Put your hands out like you were holding on to a railing. Can you see? Can you see the glory of God? In the middle of all the groanings of earth and human beings and all of the groanings, you see the Spirit at work in redeeming. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just wait. Just wait. Oh God, thank you for giving us a view today. Would you remind us to take the path that sometimes we don't take to the journey to the place where you can bring comfort, peace, as we eagerly expect and wait in anticipation of your final redemption of all things. Your creation, our human bodies, our relationships, the nations of the earth, May the Holy Spirit, which is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come, continue to intercede for us as we journey to that final day when we are glorified. Glorification in God Almighty. We praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.